Middle Earth is a game of planning, tactics, and strategy. One of the key parts of all three of those aspects is the army that you bring to war. What makes a good army? At the heart of it, something that can go on the table and have a chance of winning any scenario against any other army. Your opponent is going to try to do all of the same things that you are, so you need to make sure that your army list is best equipped to win. In this video, I'll talk about the key things that you should keep in mind when writing a competitive army, and then we'll go through some example armies. I talked to Kylie, one of the world's best players, about her list which was used to win the International Invitational Masters. So stay tuned and you'll hear about that at the end of the video. Just remember that Middle Earth is a game of skill, so a good player with a bad list will still beat a new player with a good list. The first three things on this list make up tactical flexibility. We'll start with the easy one. Your army needs hitting power. Ultimately, this is a war game and you need to be able to kill your opponent. Hitting power is all about how many wounds you can put out. Different lists get their hitting power from different sources. Some will rely on big heroes or monsters to do a majority of the wounds, whereas others will rely on solid troops. Other armies might rely on an overwhelming amount of firepower. A good way to improve the hitting power of your army is mounting your heroes on horses, making sure you have as many attacks as possible in combat, so include spears and definitely banners, and think about high strength models. Always include banners. I see a lot of new players discounting them, but trust me, they're so worthwhile. Now the next thing that you need to keep in mind is maneuverability. Maneuverability is key to winning so many of the scenarios. Many of the scenarios you need to move faster than your opponent to get the advantage. Being able to move faster means that you can surround and trap your opponent more easily, or simply close distance between you and a shooting army faster. In Reconnoiter, if you clash with your enemy deep on their side of the board, you're in a really good position to break through. In Heirlooms of Ages Past, if your army is fast, not only can you get to the objectives faster and have a better chance of finding it, but you can also regroup after Maelstrom of Battle disrupts your force. So, how can you make your army more maneuverable? Well, if you're playing an all cavalry army, you have sorted this already. Let's have a look at this regular Isengard army. At the moment, everything is movement 6. It does have a captain with heroic march, which helps, but overall it's still relatively slow. So, to improve it, I will include a drummer. This increases my maneuverability by a lot, but I'm still not done there. I'm also going to add in Shaku. It would be great to include a few Wild Riders as well. This way the army is now very fast by just adding in a handful more models. As a general rule, if your army has the option to take a war drummer and you have plenty of infantry, then take the war drum. And it's always a good idea to include a few cavalry models in your force, even if it's just two or three. Now, the third thing that makes up tactical flexibility is numbers. Numbers are important. Many scenarios require you to have more models than your opponent around objective. If you have more models, then you already have an advantage. Many scenarios also require you to fight over multiple objectives. If you have more models, you can more readily approach each objective and have your army fighting at multiple points on the board. Having more models simply gives you more options on what to do. It's vital in Middle Earth that you're able to trap your opponent. If you outnumber your enemy, it makes it a lot easier to get traps where you can then double your strike against your target. The death of all hero armies is getting surrounded and eventually botching a roll to win a fight and being taken out. Also keep in mind that if you have more models in your army, you have more attacks. There are a lot of low model count armies that do very well at tournaments, particularly Theoden's Riders and Rivendell Knights. They compensate for their low numbers with high hitting power and maneuverability. Consider it a balancing act between these three criteria. So that is all tactical flexibility in a nutshell. Let's move on to resources and tricks, or in other words, what do you have that lets you control your opponent and the battlefield? The main resource in this game is Might. Might gives you battlefield control. If you can move your models first, increase your stats, or guarantee that you can win a dice roll, you're putting yourself in the lead. Using Might effectively is one of the most exciting parts of the game and the biggest difference between a good player and an inexperienced player. Your army will need plenty of Might. Another key resource is magic. Spellcasters can give you an immense amount of control over the game. Some prevent enemy armies from being able to shoot you effectively, nullify heroes, or pull your opponent out of position, allowing them to be trapped. All of these things give you control. If you aren't using magic, you always have to think about what you would do if you come up against magic. 
There are models in the game which don't have magic, but still fill this role, like Dead Marsh Spectres, Wood Elf Sentinels, the Balrog's Fiery Lash, or the Watcher in the Water. You don't need magic in a competitive list, but just always be prepared to play against it and have a plan for it. Shooting. Now, shooting is a battlefield control method. I see a lot of players discounting bows because often they don't do that much damage and they seem pretty underwhelming. But the key role of shooting is not to kill your enemies, but to force them to have to charge you. If I have way more bows than my opponents, I'm able to sit back and fire at them while they have to go to me. If they don't come to me, then they will eventually get chipped down to nothingness. This means that you can decide where you want to engage your enemy on the battlefield. Always include a handful of archers in your army, even if it's just upgrading 3 or 4 warriors to have bows. It only costs a few points, and if your opponent doesn't have any bows, then you have a huge advantage of them. It can be some of the best points spent. If your army is even half decent at shooting, I think it's a great idea to always go for 33% bows. Also, when you're shooting, think about your target priority. If there's a big hero on horse, every single shot that you have needs to go after their horse. Courage. <clears throat> there are a lot of armies out there that cause terror and have a minus one courage bubble. If your army doesn't have an answer for this, you could be in a lot of trouble and your opponent will have so much control over you. In larger point games where you have plenty of models, Warhorns are great, but you do need to have many models for them to be worthwhile. If you're playing an evil army, shamans are super powerful. I generally wouldn't leave home without one. Other options are having troops with bodyguards, and some lists just naturally have high courage. Just always ask yourself, how would my list cope with an all terror army? Now, there are plenty of other tricks and resources in the game. Shields are a great one. Not only do they give you a higher defense, but they also give you the option to make a non-lethal strike. If your opponent is in a winning position and the game is close to over because they're nearly courted, then shielding may help the game go on for a few more turns, giving you the time to win. Consider including some non-lethal strikes in your army. War gear like throwing spears are great for forcing your opponent to call heroic moves when they otherwise wouldn't, and there are many other tricks that are more army specific. If your army has a trick, it's best to use it. Now the final thing to think about when you're writing an army list is redundancy. What happens if plan A fails? Do you have something else in the list that can back you up? For example, in this Rivendell army, what happens if Elrond's Wrath of Bruinen is resisted? Well then Arwen can come in and call it. Or in this Moria army, what happens if the Balrog is bogged down? Well then the Cave Troll and Bat Swarm can go and snipe out the heroes that the Balrog otherwise would have. This is a dice game so there is an element of chance. When you play tournaments, expect to botch some important dice rolls and make sure that when that happens, not if that happens, that you still have an answer. If you have an army list that you're thinking of playing, then leave it below in the comments and I'll give you my thoughts on it. Let's have a look at three examples of armies. A bad example, a good example, and pretty much the best example in the world. For a bad example, I have 650 points of Army of Thraw here. I've been playing this list recently. The army has all the named heroes and 15 Guardians of the King, which is Strength 4 Grimhammers. This list packs a massive punch, its hitting power is through the roof. All the warriors are Strength 4, can piercing strike, can two hand, and once per game, Thrawn can give dwarves around it plus one strength. Thrawn is a 6 inch banner, Thrain has a Master Forge two handed hammer, Thorin is all around solid, and Dwalin can put out damage like crazy. So. Why is it a bad list? Well, everything is movement 5 and I don't even have much, making this pretty much as slow as you can get. There are very few models, so as soon as the army splits up, they will get trapped and surrounded. It's not all terrible though, it does have heaps of might giving me control in combat, and Balan's ability to reroll priority and throwing weapons give it some good tricks. But it also has nothing that has a longer range than 6, so I'll pretty much always have to charge my opponent. This list is a great example of a list that's going to be good at doing certain things, like scenarios that just require you to kill the enemy. But when it needs to capture objective, it falls apart. There are a lot of other armies that excel in certain scenarios. Smaug is going to be amazing in Contest of Champions, but he will never win a tournament because he can't win objective games. Make sure your army can win every scenario. Now, a good example of a list is my Moria army. I came second place three times in a row at tournaments with different versions of this list. Let's look at the 750 point version. It's the Balrog, a bunch of goblins, Groblog with a cave troll bat swarm, some prowlers and goblins, and a captain with more prowlers and goblins. This army can hit really hard. The Balrog has 4 strength 9 attacks with fight 10, and a free heroic combat. 
The Cave Troll and Bat Swarm outfight every model in the game if they're used together, and the Prowlers get plus one to win when fighting a trapped opponent. The army's main weakness is that it isn't that maneuverable. Now it has the march from the captain and the bat swarm that can fly 12 inches, which is amazing for snagging objectives on the final turn of the game, but overall, a 5 inch movement isn't great. It's sitting on a really good number of models to be able to fight in multiple places at once, and because it's larger than a lot of armies, I can get traps, which really rewards this army because of its army bonus. It plays into the list's strengths. It has a heap of tricks, the Balrog's Fiery Lash can catch a lot of people off guard, the Bat Swarm halves enemy fight values and can jump over the enemy lines. It also has 4 wounds so it can stop a hero from heroic combating that turn. All the goblins get plus 1 to fight when the enemy is trapped, and Groblog can give them plus 1 fight as well, which means a Prowler could go from fight 3 to fight 5 which outfights most captain level models. This army is low on might, so I'm going to spend all 5 of those might points on heroic moves in general. The Balrog acts as a shaman, giving off fearless to nearby models, and in terms of redundancy, I know that either the Balrog or the Cave Troll Bat Swarm combo can take down whatever big hero they need to. Now before we go into the final list, I've recently launched my web store, where I'm selling minis and resin cast bases that you can either buy fully finished or unpainted. They're super affordable and there is worldwide shipping. If you could check it out, that would mean a lot. Thanks guys! Kylie's about to talk about her Articon Invitational International Masters winning list, but the list is the Witch King with the Crown of Morgul and 3 Might, 15 Will and 3 Fate, 7 Angmar Orc Warriors with Shields, 4 Orc Warriors with Shields and Spears, 5 Orcs with Bows, and an Orc with a Banner. Now Warband 2 is led by a Barrow White, has 7 Angmar Orcs with Shields, 4 Angmar Orcs with Shields and Spears. Warband 3 is led by Gulivar, the Terror of Arnor, 3 Deadmarsh Spectres, and finally Warband 4 is an Orc Captain with a Shield on a Warg with 3 Warg Riders with Shield and Throwing Spear, coming in at 750 points. Hello, hello everyone, my name is Kylie, and I'm here to give a brief rundown of my Angmar list that I used to win the 2019 Archon International Masters. This list is designed around enabling Gulivar the Terror of Armor. Gulivar excels at detaining the flow of battle with his high mobility and damage potential, meaning he is a threat to even the tankiest of heroes. Gully is supported by the Witch King and a Barrowite, whose primary job is to peel and lock down targets for Gully, stripping enemy heroes of their valuable might points to disable their heroic actions. The Captain is the unsung hero of this list. His additional two might points with March allow my army to engage enemy forces from up to 20 inches away. This threat range is vital to dealing with enemy bow fire and supporting Gulivar's dives. Next we have my three spectres which provide invaluable crowd control of my opponent's force, allowing my army to better deal with shades, trolls and the like. Finally the Angmar orcs provide a solid frontline that can be hard to engage due to their terror and I've also ensured that nearly every orc has a shield. This means my army can withstand nature's wrath more readily and be able to survive longer thanks to the shielding special rule. Once you add in a couple of honesty bows, the orcs form one of the best cores to an army in the game. This list is all about being flexible and redundant. Double casters allow me to switch from a defensive to a good aggressive playstyle in the space of a turn and having both Gulivar and the Witch King means my army can pivot from enabling one or the other should my opponents be skilled enough to take one of them down. So there we have it. That is how to write a competitive army list. There are going to be some exceptions, and sometimes armies that don't fill any of these criteria will still do really well. Now let me know what you think about this video. Is there anything that you think I missed? Let me know in the comments. I think it's great to have a discussion. And thanks for watching. Until next time, have a good one.